Hello. So boundaries are tricky things, and when you play with them, I think people tend to develop feelings. Today I want us to talk about the boundaries that we've drawn around CSS and how I've seen them change and even maybe helped them change over the last decade or so. I also want to talk about how these boundaries affect us as people and how we see ourselves and how they can affect our lives in real and tangible ways. When I first got into developing on SAS, I bumped into this article by Bert Boss, who's a co-creator of CSS. And he wrote an essay on why variables in CSS are harmful. If you ever want to write an article about something being harmful, maybe don't. But in here he says, adding any form of macros or additional scopes or indirections, including symbolic constants, is not just redundant, but changes CSS in ways that make it unsuitable for its intended audience. Given that there is currently no alternative to CSS, these things must not be added. All right, so that was the original design philosophy, and I think we're starting to see the philosophy of CSS is changing. But I want to dig into this a little bit. Who is this intended audience of, of CSS? Certainly all of you. I scoured the web in research for this talk, and I looked for some hints, some clues about who these el elusive people are who CSS is made for. And I found the thesis written by Hakon Lee, who is the other co-creator of CSS. Uh, he wrote this thesis a little bit after uh, CSS had already pretty much won the style sheet wars, uh, and went into a lot of the differences between the various alternatives and the designs, just choices that they made. And uh, one of those alternatives was called DSSSL, and it was a scheme variant, which scheme is a Lisp language. It was a full programming language you could use to style your website. Uh, to which Hakon said, syntax, that syntax was considered to be unsuitable for non-programmers. And I think this gets at one of the core design philosophies of CSS, which is that we, they wanted CSS to be accessible to people who didn't know how to program. I think in order to talk about what non-programmers are, we have to first understand what programming is. Uh, and fairly early on in my career, I figured out that programming is really just moving data from one place to another. You might transform it a little bit along the way. So that little arrow right there, that's us writing programs. Here's an example of something that is very clearly programming. This is a function that is computing the Fibonacci sequence. It's taking in some data, which is you know, the nth element of the Fibonacci sequence, and it's returning the value of that sequence. Data in, some transformation, data out. At a systems level, we're moving data from major server to other servers, from components to components, but it's all just data. It's moving about from the database to objects, from objects to HTML, from our servers to our browsers, and from the browsers to the screen. All of these are considered programming except one. That CSS file that transforms your HTML data into pixel data, evidently that's not programming. Uh, he goes on to say that one of the very controversial decisions at the time was to create a declarative uh, language expressing constraints rather than a Turing complete programming language. A programming language would have a, been a more powerful solution, but it comes at a cost. So what does it mean, this non-Turing complete declarative language? This is computer science speak. So let's talk about computer science. Uh, this is Alan Turing and the term Turing complete comes from him. And why do people care about it? Well, one of the things he created, and he's basically the father of modern computer science, so he created a lot of things, uh, was the Turing machine. This is a uh, theoretical computer. It's built on top of concepts that are convenient to reason about in terms of mathematical proofs and theorems. Not so great in real world computation, but it's been proven that this Turing machine can do basically anything that this laptop can do, albeit in a much longer time frame. So a language is called Turing complete when it can compute anything that a Turing machine can compute with the help of a computer. 
So some things that a Turing machine can do, like looping and branching. Uh, like I said, it can calculate stuff that your laptop can do. Uh, but a Turing machine can also do something very interesting. It can run forever. We call this an infinite loop in our code. So something a Turing machine definitely cannot do is analyze the instructions given to another Turing machine and determine whether or not that machine will ever stop. And in general, we can basically say that computers can't can decide much about anything about other programs except as heuristics because in general cases, you can almost always transform a question about a program and how it will behave into whether or not that another program will stop if it behaves that way. You've probably seen this dialogue in your browser at one point in time or another. <clears throat> when the browser put this up, it did not know whether or not your program was going to complete one millisecond later. It paused it and said, I don't know, taking a long time, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm pretty sure that the browser makers would have loved to have made some really awesome dialogue that was like, hey, this page is gonna hang if I run it, so I'm not going to. Right here on this line, that's where there's a bug. Why don't you ask the author to fix it? Browsers can't do this. Not being Turing complete means that other programs can reason about CSS. And that turns out to be a really powerful behavior about CSS. Unfortunately, it's not the reason that they gave. <clears throat> a programming language would have been more powerful, but it comes at a cost. Programs are so difficult to maintain. And they're hard to read. So boiling this all down, programming's hard. Styling should be easy. Therefore, styling definitely cannot be programming. All right, I'm gonna give you programming is hard. I searched Google for programming is hard. I got 214 million results. Uh, and I've done some programming, so yeah, that's, that's hard. But styling, that, that should be easy. That's why we have conferences about it. Why should styling be easy? So the cynical part of me has this suspicion that uh, programmers actually just think design is easy. Uh, or it might be that programmers think design is annoying. I've talked to a lot of developers who are like, uh, I don't know, they always come to me with changes, I don't really understand them, they seem arbitrary, it's a, no it's, it's a pain in my butt. I'd rather just teach the designers how to do this and make it their problem. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I think maybe back when we were designing CSS, the kind of styling that we were designing CSS for Maybe it was easy, uh, but I don't think that's the kind of styling that we're doing now. I think that document styling has become creating design systems for highly interactive applications. So yes, it was a simpler time back then. CSS1 had 53 properties, most of them around making fonts and backgrounds and things like that. But over time, that complexity has increased. Uh, by CSS2, we had 122 properties. By CSS3, 316. We've given up on even versioning CSS now. We're just throwing properties in there as soon as we can get them in. But I want us to all keep in mind that to a web browser, pretty much every element is identical to the layout engines and to the styling engines. Uh, CSS and the default properties that are assigned to those elements are how elements vary to the layout engine, which means that CSS is the front end to the immense complexity that is the, C, the, the browser engine. So I don't know why we thought CSS should be easy. And in my opinion, if you're gonna make a system and design it well, you need to account for the increasing complexity of that system. The creators of CSS, they were super smart guys, and I don't mean to malign them too much. Uh, they thought about how CSS could evolve, create new constructs. We have this idea of progressive enhancement, which is really well done. Um, but at the end of the day, we cannot reason about a system that is very complex without decomposing it. Like was mentioned earlier in the post-CSS talk, that we need to break things up into modules just to be able to understand them. And so styling is not easy. It is a core assumption to the design of CSS, and I believe that it is flawed, and that the decisions that we 
based that assumption on, they really need to be reevaluated. Because, like it or not, those decisions have effects not just at a technical level, but they actually affect us as people. Uh, those language boundaries that we've created around the different technologies that we use, they define us. I'm willing to bet that every single one of us here identifies as one of the labels that are up on the screen right now. Certainly CSS developer, JavaScript developer, front-end developer, hopefully a few SaaS developers in here. Um, these labels can create a sense of community and belonging, and that's a really powerful thing. Uh, when we attach ourselves to one of these labels, it helps us feel like we're doing something great and part of something important. Uh, but they also have a downside. These boundaries can affect how other people view us. I asked on Twitter recently, if your main job is authoring CSS, have you ever actually been told that you're not a developer or a programmer? 63% of people said yes. That's not necessarily how we view ourselves. When I asked, if your main job is authoring CSS, do you feel like you're a developer or a programmer? And 71% said yes. This is a major disparity between how people are viewing us and how we view ourselves. But more interesting to me than that is the 29% of people that say no, that they've actually bought into the idea that they're not developing anything when they write CSS. The bulk of technologies that we use in modern web development um, have lots of similarities to each other. They have lots of touch points. Um, for instance, when you're writing HTML, you're using a templating language, and that templating language is accessing object models and business logic, and those things are touching the database and doing SQL queries. If you start using one part of it, you start to learn the others. You kind of progress about slowly. You absorb the learning. And then we've got CSS stuck over here on the side. And this is completely intentional. Um, and I think that one of the things we did really well with SAS is that we actually brought SAS closer to the rest of what we're doing. And we did that, frankly, uh, by adding programming concepts to CSS. Um, <clears throat> Nicole Sullivan, who created OOCSS, uh, she and I are good friends and told me that she had done a little Java programming before she got into CSS development, but it felt really abstract to her. And when she got around to learning SAS, that connected the programming concepts uh, that she had learned um, through SAS and through college and brought it into a domain in which she was already competent. And at that point, she was able to take uh, what she knew about SAS and what she knew about CSS and check the outputs and make sure everything was working right. And then later on, she was able to go on and learn JavaScript and, and transfer that knowledge that way. So SAS has moved the boundaries of style sheets into a world of more procedural programming. And we provided the things that CSS wouldn't. Those macros, those additional scopes, those indirections, those symbolic constants, and we gave an alternative to CSS. And nowadays, I think more than half, at least, of people are using SAS to develop style sheets today instead of CSS. We moved the boundaries of CSS, and initially, oh my god, did it bother people. Uh, I got so many tweets from people being like, you just don't understand CSS. If you got it, you wouldn't be doing this. Uh, so let's ask, like, was our prediction unsuitable for the target audience? Like, that was the claim. We, they, we went into CSS thinking that if we did that, it, like, people wouldn't get it. And I say no. I think that SAS gives tools that are needed by people who are authoring style sheets to express the relationships that are intrinsic to the, to the design systems they are working on. And due in part to the adoption of SAS, CSS is changing now. As we've already heard mentioned today, this new project, Houdini, is uh, really important. It is, its goal is to develop features that expose the magic of styling and layout on the web, and this is huge. 
So Houdini is actually the response for CSS to this extensible web manifesto. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, um, but I was one of the original co-signers of it, and I believe very strongly in the goal of making uh, the boundary of the browser, which used to be down in the depths of like C++ um, and like really nitty gritty code, and up-leveling that into the, the world of JavaScript, into the domain of JavaScript developers. We're stripping away one of those boundaries. And I think that's really awesome. CSS custom properties, V2, uh, will allow us to do things like register properties, but in a way that uh, is much more efficient. There's gonna be ability to make custom paints doing vector graphics on the screen. Uh, and there's so much more. I'm not gonna cover Houdini. Uh, Daniel's gonna cover that in a minute. But <clears throat> um, the point is, is that the extensible web manifesto and Houdini are moving the, brown, the boundary of the browser's engine up. And Houdini is going to unlock CSS and finally make it extensible to web developers. But there's still a problem. Houdini is still across a boundary for many CSS developers, probably especially those 29% of people who don't think of themselves as developers. Houdini, like PostCSS, it takes the extensibility that SAS put in the style sheet itself and it puts it into the hands of JavaScript. And I'll be the first to acknowledge that JavaScript is a much better programming language than the SAS scripting language that we put in SAS, especially for really complex programming tasks. Forcing CSS to be a technology where uh, we have to now learn JavaScript in order to extend uh, the language that as a CSS developer we're working in, it worries me. I think that SAS's success proves that native extensibility is both viable and beneficial to the CSS ecosystem. I think that we can do more than just make the web extensible. I think we can make the web more learnable. Now to be clear, not everybody needs or wants to move down the stack. Developing CSS as your main job is a really hard job, and if that's what you love doing, just do that, and I want the language of CSS to support you in that decision. But I also want the decision of SAS, or sorry, the decision of CSS to, uh, to help you move into the rest of web development if that's where you want to go in your career path. So yes, the boundaries of CSS and the web in general, they're moving. Um, but I wonder whether or not they're moving far enough. The ramifications of these decisions, they're, they're a little bit bigger than we might think. For instance, I wonder how many CSS developers are not paid the same salary as other developers on their team simply because the management doesn't think it's programming. Um, I've also noted that there are significantly more women programming and doing development in CSS than, there, than they are doing other web technologies. Is that simply because women prefer CSS more or is that because some of our stereotypes about CSS and some of our stereotypes about women and gender seem to have some overlaps? I think we can do better and I'm confident that we will. All the signs are positive. Houdini is amazing, and uh, I can't wait for it to happen, and uh, I think all of us need to get involved um, because, like it or not, Houdini is gonna be a major step, but we need to make sure that it's in the direction that we think it should go as a community. Thank you. <laughs>